Yan, hello, hello mga kameta, kamusta kay Jan? Grabe, grabe, ito, ito talaga. So over the weekend, katulad ng uh, nag-guest nyo, we have been following very closely itong situation sa Russia. Obviously, alam nyo naman pagdating sa Sabbath day, hindi talaga tayo nag, uh, nag-meta on Sundays. But I've been keeping uh, abreast with the developments. In fact, nung uh, huling vlog po natin, uh, ito, po yung, uh, ito po yung nasa gitna pa nung uh, kasagsagan ng ang sugod ng Wagner Mercenary Army. Hindi lang dun sa Rostov at saka yung Southern Military Command ng Russia na na-occupy easily ng mga Wagner groups. But actually, nag-march na sila papunta sa Moscow uh, by the time na we were... Um, uh, doing yung previous vlog natin no so grabe talaga yung so hanggang mga 3 am uh dami pa ring suspense at biglang banda mga i think 1 to 2 am our time but towards the evening jan sa local time sa Russia biglang nagkaroon ng another plot twist no so obviously the first plot twist kung mga pwede mo sabihin first three acts no so in a Shakespearean sense yung first act was that uh, si uh, yung head ng Wagner Group, si Yevgeny uh, Prigozhin, hindi lang siya nag-challenge doon sa, I mean verbally challenge doon sa uh, mga top defense leaders ng Russia, especially si Shoigo, yung kanilang defense uh, minister, and to a lesser degree yung kanilang head of chief of uh, uh, staff. Uh, but increasingly, directly chin na challenge na yung buong political system ng Russia. No? That was in Act 1 Kasi for 4 or 5 months Nakita natin na ito si Yevgeny Prigozhin uh, Very consistent na kikriticized Doon sa mga defense establishment But the other thing that made this very interesting mga kameta was How easily and how seamlessly uh, Si Prigozhin was able to mobilize his forces Take over yung southern command sa Rostov uh, Ng Russia And then from there work it all the way to Moscow Almost unopposed or with very very limited resistance No, So yun yung act 2 Na happening very fast So my strange 24 hours window situation tayo dun sa Russia Na talagang grabe, grabe no? I mean this was completely unforeseen Expectation ng iba dyan is there would be some sort of resistance There would be some sort of pushback But that's not what happened no? So sobrang grabe no? uh, How fast yung act 2 was Which was yung mobilization of military dun sa Russia No? Uh, uh, and this is where may kita mo na maraming mga uh, critics na nag-comment na Hey, parang not long ago, sasabihin nila not long ago Not long ago, ang Russia po is considered as the second most powerful military in the world But now, uh, but now ang sinisabi nila is uh, Russia is not even second uh forget about in Europe it's 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 second sa Ukraine dahil talo sila ng Ukraine over the past year pero yung parang biro ng iba is that yung Russian armed forces ay second din sa loob ng Russia dahil etong Wagner army group pa lang uh, hirap na hirap sila so nakita natin na actually based on some news hindi po completely bloodless itong mutiny or coup na nangyari over the weekend uh based on some of the reports we saw half a dozen helicopters uh, were shut down no so ito uh, six uh, six Russian army helicopters were were shot down based on some of the reports we're seeing not only from the Ukrainian side from but from the different side so uh, some would say that's that's almost six to seven percent of the total comparable assets and uh, shut down in Ukraine over one year of war with all the help of NATO etc so the act two was very important one because do na natin na talagang either very widespread yung discontent right either sobrang demoralized and demobilized internally yung yung russian uh, defense forces dahil bogged down sila sa Russia, uh, sa ukraine uh, and potentially marami nag uh, sympathize dun sa mga complaints at mga grievances or potentially combination of the two no na so but dito papasok yung act 3 because Within just few hours after yung vlog natin mga kameta, as the Wagner army was marching on, Rosh, on, on, on Moscow, almost unopposed, biglang boom, nagkaroon daw ng isang deal, supposedly deal, kung saan si, uh, si Lukashenko, ito po yung uh, dictator ng, ng Belarus, no? 
supposedly nag-cut ng deal with Prigozhin to make sure na hindi na siya susugod all the way to Moscow. But to turn around, and this is what actually happened because pwede mo makita talaga yan sa, sa mga... Uh, sa mga monitors, satellite imagery, reports, etc. But, so, bumalik siya. And then, sa ilalim ng deal na yan, biglang papatawarin si Prigozhin at saka yung mga kanya mga Wagner, uh, lieutenants, and supposedly, allow din siya na to leave the country, meaning Russia, but end up in Belarus. So, this is where suddenly things get like a little bit weird. Like, what's going on here? Because, Just to put into, things into context, mga kameta, kung tinignan mo yung mga reports dun sa kasagsagan ng sugod ng, uh, ng Wagner Group, ito po yung mga reports na nakita natin na yung mga top oligarchs, top Russian politicians ay lumilipad na, umaalis na ng bansa. No? Papunta sa Baku, Azerbaijan, papunta sa Turkey, a lot of them to Istanbul, Turkey. So, So we can see more and more of the top oligarchs were actually leaving. So okay, nga others were saying the ship is sinking already. But I think this is also where we can have a kind of a glimpse into what happened at bakit biglang bumalik tad si Prigozhin. Now, let's talk about a number of things here, mga kameta, because they, that 24-hour window in Russia, I call it short coup, long crisis, no? So, hindi po tapos ang crisis because ang dami pang mga questions na raised ng itong mga multiple tr- plot twists at three acts na nangyari dito mga kameta. So, as I said, the first thing that we saw here is gaano ka hollow at gaano ka vulnerable yung Russian defense establishment. no Easily nag-march in ang mga Wagner groups. Uh, at nakita natin, may mga, may some would even say reports suggest na baka may element pa ng public support. No? Nakita natin sa mga videos kung saan ginigreet sila ng mga tao dun sa Rostov after easily occupying yung Southern Command of Russian military no? uh, over the weekend. That's one thing to keep in mind. No? Na sobrang vulnerable sila. Internally, hindi lang sila bugbog at talo dun sa Ukraine. Internally rin, it's not clear who's really in charge. Kaya sobrang easily nag-melt away lahat, sobrang easily nakapasok yung Wagner Army. But the second important thing to keep in mind is this, mga kameta. Uh, so marami tayong mga charlatans at clowns, including dito sa ating bansa, na mahilig mag-apologize dun sa sugod ng, uh, ng Russia sa Ukraine. At yung sinasabi ng iba dyan is, ay, dahil ito, dahil kailangan nila mag-denazify, kailangan ng self-defense, kailangan ng ganyan-ganyan, kasi NATO expansion, blah, blah, blah. Now, what's the interesting thing is, Bago si Progozhin biglang mag off radar after the supposed deal na pag-usapan natin shortly. Actually, he had he released this video. At titingnan niyo yung video na yan. Post ko rin yun para you can see it live. So there's actually translation down kung saan inexplain niya na yung sinasabi nila, si right now sabi niya, Minister of Defense trying to deceive the society and the president and tell a story that there was insane aggression from the Ukrainian side and they were going to attack us together with the whole NATO bloc. No? So, klarong-klaro siya na ito ay isang deception. No? Yun ang sinasabi ni Progoshin na, of course, his version is, ito po ay isang conspiracy ng mga oligarchs at yung mga tao na gustong kumuha ng glory out of invasion of Ukraine, thinking easily pwede nila ma-invade. No? So, dun ma-explain niya sa video niya, uh, Let's see if I can project the, the video but I can see it on your own no? uh, mga kameta now this puts into question yung supposed pretext no? yung mga sinasabi ng apologies dahil yung mga pa-progressive dyan na ito ito na defensive yung ginagawa ng Russia alam mo naman yung mga ibang pa-progressive basta anything against the West dun sila kaagad diba? uh, pa-progressive ah, hindi mga totoo let me just show you the video para makita nyo yung na inexplain niya yung situation. So, so ako kasi I'm 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 looking at all the angles here. Hindi lang tayo nagpapadala doon sa mga latest drama, latest ekeg. Tinitingnan talaga natin mga kameta. Uh, ano yung mga implication nito? So, even if tapos na yung coup at least supposedly for now, hindi tapos yung crisis na yan because labasan na yan eh. <laughs> Dami naglabasan eh. Wait lang. Um How did I put uh, browser I think. Ito, ito, ito. So, ito yung kanyang 
ЛНР ДНР. Существовали корпуса народной милиции, которые в случае нападения украинцев должны были дать достойный Однако эти корпуса не, существу... не существовали. По факту было минимальное количество бойцов и определенное количество генералов, Просто распиливали эти деньги. При заплате 40 тысяч, 20 тысяч оставлялось в кассе, 20 тысяч давалось тому, кто подписывает, если боец существовал и сидит дома. Подготовка не велась, а мертвые души просто получали эти деньги. Генералы получали за мертвые души эти деньги, и бюджеты пилились. Донбасс был прекрасным местом, где распиливались деньги, как сотрудниками администрации президента, Сначала это был Сурков, потом был Казак. ФСБ тоже была абсолютно понятная иерархия генералов. Теперь по тому, почему началась спецоперация. Украинцы имели группу, которая находилась по границе с, Донбасса, с территории Донбасса, как раз ту, которую мы проламывали от Попасной до Артемовска. Эта группировка состояла из различных добровольных, скажем так, националистических формирований, а также состояла из э, действующей армии ВСУ. Эта группировка обменивалась выстрелами. Мы били по ним, они били по нам, и это происходило все эти долгие 8 лет, с 14 по 22 -й. Иногда нарастало количество различных э, перестрелок, грубо говоря, обмена боеприпасами, обменом выстрелами. Иногда уменьшалось. На 24 февраля ничего сверхординарного не было. Сейчас уже Министерство обороны yeah. пытается обмануть общественность, и рассказать историю о том, что со стороны Украины была безумная агрессии и они собирались вместе со всем блоком НАТО на нас напасть. Поэтому so you guys, все just операции, just так называемые, она была начата совершенно по другим. Yeah. So, ayan, mahalaga yan because pati yung ideological foundations at saka yung basis, mga kamet, anong basis ng, ng justification, ng invasion. Biglang kinakwestiyon na ni Prokosin, no? At tignan niya talaga on your own, mga kamet. At tignan niya talaga yung the way explained. This is very, very important. So, medyo may bukingan na talaga nangyari dito. Kaya nga yung sinasabi ko doon sa mga charlatans dyan na, hindi, defensive yung gano'n. Ay, nako! Pakinggan niya from the, from the mouth of horse, the horse, you know? From the horse of the mouth. Tignan niya, pakinggan niya naman kasi sila mismo naglalaglagan na, okay? Sila mismo naglalaglagan na. Tignan niya talaga... Sabi niya, right now, ito yung deception. This is that they're trying to deceive the society and the president and tell a story that there was insane aggression from Ukraine and they were going to attack us together with the whole NATO bloc. So, he's saying deception yan. Very clearly sinasabi niya yan. No? Na hindi totoo yan. No? At dyan, he'll go on long run explaining na oh, maraming corruption involved, mga oligarchs, may conspiracy, etc. So, that's why I'm saying itong mga kameta. Itong event na to ay napakamahalaga because nagbubukingan na sila dun sa loob. Hindi nga sa loob, eh. kitang kita natin in the whole world, di ba? So, that's why this is very relevant. Now, another thing that I want to emphasize here is dun sa, the reason why yung deal between Lukashenko and Purgozhin is very, uh, like, I'm not sure, I buy it. Like, seriously, tingin talaga ni Purgozhin na maging safe siya sa Belarus lang, which is under a, uh, you know, be Beshi ni you know, Putin, or at least Beshi recently ni Putin. And, and that, hayan lang siya, basta ganyan lang, after sasabihin ni Paolo Putin na, na there was, uh, <clears throat> there was treason, na there was betrayal of the nation. Klarong-klaro talaga si Paolo Putin yung bawat that. Eh. And after, sinugod all the way to, to Moscow, nag-shutdown ng six helicopters, at least after all of that, biglang, sige pare, okay lang tayo, doon ka na lang, pahinga ka na lang dyan. I mean, Seriously, sino na wala sa ganyan? Alright, sino na wala sa ganyan? Um, but one of the other things we also understood from yung speech ni Pangulong Putin the other day is that hindi siya, 
natutuwa sa mga lefties or communists, etc. So, kasi dun sa speech niya, very openly, very openly dun sa speech niya, nung nag-threaten siya dun sa Wagner Group na wag niyo kaming test, don't threaten me, how dare you, etc. Although he, di- he directly did not name the Wagner chief. Dito nakita natin na si Paolo Putin, he clearly compared yung situation na nangyari over the weekend doon sa pag-hijack sa estado ng Rusia ang, ang mga Bolsheviks noong 1970s. So I'll just give you a very quick uh, summary of what happened. So noong First World War, si Tsar Nicholas II yung in charge. Medyo mahinang leader, medyo indecisive, marami siya mga problema sa buhay, may Rasputin ka pa, ang daming drama. You know? And by 1905 pa lang, marami na mga galit sa kanila, peasants coming out, there was very violent tra- uh, crackdown on them. So, I can recommend to you a number of great books on Russia, no? For, para ma-appreciate yung context. So, things were kind of crazy. Now, pumasok ang Russia sa Gera, sa First World War, bubuk sila doon. Now, towards the end of World War I, 1917, biglang nagkaroon ng internal revolution sa Russia, no? Initially, actually, nang take over sa Russia after the Tsarist regime fell uh, fell apart, ay si Kerensky at saka yung mga more social democratic socialist type, hindi yung mga sobra, Mensheviks, no? So Kerensky, Mensheviks. But within a month or so, uh, nag-mobilize yung mga Bolsheviks, no? Mga opportunista sila, they mobilized, they came in, they did an, a little revolution, violent revolution within revolution, and they took over. The next thing you know, they're there in charge for the next... 80, 17 years, no? Ajan <laughs> sa, sa Russia. Now, si Putin, dun sa attack niya sa Wagner Group, kinumpara niya, yun, yung potential yung potentially pwede mangyari if mag-take over ang Wagner Group, dun sa ginawa ng mga Bolsheviks. He didn't mention them, but that was essentially the implication. Kaya ito si Yanis Varoufakis, isa sa mga lodi natin. Yanis, datang finance minister ng Greece, napaka, napaka matalinong tao, napaka... Uh, tapang na tao. Itong tao, nung finance minister siya ng Greece, inattack-attack na yung European Union, inattack na yung West for imposing very, very harsh, unfair, punitive, austerity measures sa Greece after the debt crisis. Very critical siya sa imperialist acts of the West. Very critical siya doon sa gera sa, sa Middle East, laban sa Iraq, invasion of Iraq. So this is a person who has been consistently criticizing the West doon sa kanilang excesses, including excesses of how they dealt with smaller Western country or quote-unquote Western country like Greece. So Yanis Varoufakis is proven on the record criticizing capitalism, criticizing imperialism, criticizing invasion of Iraq, criticizing austerity against Greece. At the same time, ito yung reminder niya. Kung tinignan mo yung the way President Putin explained the 1970s situation, essentially drawing a parallel between the Wagner group and the Bolsheviks, That is a reminder, sabi niya. It's a reminder to leftists who erred into tolerating Putin. He's, he always hated the left. Hindi siya pa left. Hindi siya left. He, he never... In fact, parating may mention ng mga Putin supporters is... Is not necessarily the Lenin, not necessarily the communist revolution, but the tough, strong leader they had under Stalin. And some would say very brutal leader. No, so And that's not about communism. That's about strong leadership. Essentially kind of a form of a czardom, right? Aggressive modern czardom. So, that's why mahalag yan because Kameta, I remember very well dito sa Pilipinas, just the other year we had some of these empresarios, some of these charlatans uh, saying that no, there'll be no invasion of Russia, blah, blah, blah. Oh, ito, ito, ito. For instance, we had these kinds of articles. Ito, 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 ito. Basahin niyo on your own, di ba? Ito, ito. So, February 23 na publish ito, no? This is just days before the invasion. I was there in Europe back then, union discussions in Munich Security Conference, and then we have my mga tao dito sa Pilipinas. Oh, the Russians are coming, meaning like pinagtatawanan niya yung mga sinisabi nila, ano, uh, sinisabi nila Biden, etc. na susugurin sila. Ito, at, ito yung quote na ginamit niya. Tingnan niya na. Sabi niya. In war, truth is the first victim. Disinformation spreads false narratives. And war hysterias. Ito, 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 ito. Talagang ito yung mga sinasabi na Basahin nyo on your own And then these people now are pretending they're experts on BRICS and Russian whatever Like, get out of here yeah, Ito yung sinabi niya Ito, ito, ito Ito yung sinabi ng mga to Mga supposedly experts 
supposedly progressives. Ito yung sinabi niya. In war, truth is the first weak thing. Disinformation spreads false narratives and war hysteria. Ito, Biden's war hype is wrapped in a fog and navigating it adroitly is the only way to find the truth. Well, guess what? Few days later, in-invade ang Ukraine. So, anong, ano ng mga to? Di ba? Anong mga ek-ek na mga ek-ek na yan, ha? Eh, yan ang problema, eh. Dapat magka-call out yung mga ganitong clown show na yan, eh. Ha? So, makinig kayo dun sa mga totoong progressives, katulad ni Yanis Varoufakis, who questions the Western imperialism and questions Eastern-Western imperialism. Both imperialism at the same time. Kung totoong progressive ka, you will question any kind of imperialism. You will question the invasion of Iraq. It's not necessarily the same case with Ukraine, but still, that invasion had very questionable basis and it, 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 it inflicted a lot of harm on a lot of people. Meron tayong mga top officials from US mismo na aminado na mali talaga yung ginawa nila sa Russia. Mali din yung withdrawal sa Afghanistan the way they withdrew. You criticize that. But you also criticize pag in-invade lang yung ibang bansa na katulad natin na post-colonial, mahina, etc. Ayun pala, kaso mahina na, binugbog pa yung ganyan. That's what I'm saying, mga kameta. That's what I'm saying. You know, we have to call out the charlatan shows and all of that. Kung totoong progressive ka, you'll question all sorts of imperialism. No? Tayo, na-question natin yung ginagawang bullying sa atin sa West Philippine Sea. But that doesn't mean we forget also what happened to our people 100 years ago or 300 years ago sa ilalim ng mga Western imperialists. But let's not forget, we're talking about today. Today, ang kalaban po natin sa West Philippines ay hindi Amerika. Today po, ang threat sa Taiwan ay hindi Amerika or Japan, right? So, yun yung sinasabi ko eh. Yun yung sinasabi ko. At si Tatay Digong, yung mga ganyan types, kung talagang for historical justice ka, anong sinabi mo sa Japan? Baka sobrang beshi ka sa Japan. Eh, yung mga krimen ng Japan sa atin noong 1940s pa yan. Hindi yan 100 years ago. Hindi yan 300 years ago. Bakit parang tahimik ka pagdating sa Japan? Ha? Huh? So, yun yung sinasabi ko eh. Kaya ako, dito tayo sa mga katulad ni Yanis Varoufakis, you question Western imperialism or Western interventions, military interventions that cause pain, and, but you don't know, don't go and jump immediately and try to apologize for the other side. That's not true. True progress. And now, kita natin, bukingan talaga na questionable talaga yung sinisabi ng mga empresaries and charlatans na ganito, ganyan, ganyan. Alam na natin na nangyayari sa law. Alam natin na itong war, yung justification is very questionable. Now, having said that, I do believe though that NATO's expansion in general was not the wisest move. Especially when they promised to expand and then they did not expand to include Ukraine, they got the both, worst of both worlds. We can discuss about that. But I think NATO summit yan towards uh, the end of the Bush administration whereby the potential inclusion of Georgia and Ukraine was discussed, but no one was serious to bring them in. So you just made them a target without support. So that was a big mistake by NATO. No question about that. Right? No question about that. Right? No. And, and, and of course, maraming kapal pa ng NATO in terms of the war in, Af in, in Afghanistan, etc. But again, this, that should not make us forget what's going on here, no? The invasion sa, sa Ukraine. So, what I'm saying here, mga kameta, is that we are serious people. When we talk about this issue, we really study them very carefully. We're very familiar with these issues. We're not saying we're Russia experts per se, but we have been following these issues very, very carefully throughout the years, di ba? And, and let me end on this point. What is my initial hunch dun sa nangyari sa kunayan? Bakit it fizzled out? My understanding is basically this, mga kameta. Ito si Progozhin, I think he himself was surprised uh, by how fast he was able to march all the way to Moscow. Not enter Moscow per se, but he was like within 100, 200 kilometers from Moscow. Um, I think what happened here, mga kameta, is nagfold siya at the last minute. Because, because of two things. Because of two things. First, I think, Ang hope ni Yevgeny Prigozhin was that there will be mass defections to him, right? That the other big elites in Moscow will defect him. I think yun yung hope niya. Na as he marches on, magde-defect yung iba, magsasight sa kanya, so there'll be a political block. Guess what? That didn't happen. So tulad na nakita natin, tumatakos na lang yung mga tao, ay nila magsight sa kanya. Which brings me to the second part. I think the second reason is siya mismo wala siyang political vision. Because it's one thing to win the game of violence and coup, military violence coup, but it's another game entirely to have a political vision and political capital and political charisma. 
because it's one thing to topple one regime, it's another thing to replace it with something stable and, and durable and acceptable to other major powers. Yun yung wala sa kanya. So ito ay isang dating chef, dating ex-convict, I mean, well, dating, ex-convict na, uh, na, na, uh, na, yeah, yeah, na the head ng mercenary, pero wala siyang political capital. Hindi siya acceptable internationally. Hindi siya known as a political actor. Uh, uh, wala siyang political vision. So I think big dun na realize niya na wait lang, parang uh, can we pull this off even if we succeed militarily to topple the regime? So had he had yung political capital vision of someone like Navalny who's in jail because lahal ng opposition ay tumakas na or nasa jail, then probably the things would have turned out very differently. So yun nga, with coups, it has to be backed up by political vision and political operators and, 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 and transition game plan. I don't think this guy had any of those things. Kaya the last moment na realize niya, parang lose-lose situation ang mangyari dito, so nag-back out siya. Nevertheless, that only explains why nag-fold yung military coup. That doesn't explain whether the supposed deal is true or can hold. Now, let me also be very clear. I'll close on this point, mga kameta. Para sa akin, kalokohan yung sinasabi ng iba na lahat yan ay isang show. Well, guess what? Even if scripted lahat yan, clearly it didn't turn out. It didn't turn out very well, yung execution. At clearly, nakita na nag-panic mode na iba, tumatakas na. So, and... and that's the point. Even if nagkaroon ng deal na yan, nakita natin yung weakness ng system eh. Nakita natin na hindi ito yung sistema kung saan one man completely controls everything. So, <laughs> kung ito ay isang scripted show, it's not gonna help anyone as far as yung mga supposed protagonist and conspirators are concerned. It's not. This is a crazy situation. This is what happened. And dun sa mga familiar, dun sa kasaysayan ng Russia over the past hundred years alone, forget about since, you know, the you know fall of Ivan the Terrible and the Romanov. Even if you're not the Romanov dynasty experts, just look at from the fall of Nicholas II and Tsar all the way to 1991, or actually all the way to Yeltsin and to Putin. Grabe yung kasaysayan ng Russia. Ang dami mga wild swings na nangyari. Nevertheless, for me, I can understand while nagfold, yung mga behind the mutiny but I cannot see how the supposed deal is gonna work anytime soon kaya ang conclusion ko for now is it was a short coup pero may mahaba-habang crisis na mangyari dyan sa Russia for quite some time and we're gonna watch very carefully now as I said whether you're pro-Putin anti-Putin whatever the reason we have to watch this carefully is because Russia has one of the largest stockpiles of nuclear weapons it's one of the most important countries out there uh, so, lahat tayo, wala tayong interest na makita natin na maging magulong Russia. No? Now, of course, we want a free, democratic, whatever. But, <laughs> I think marami nagsabi dyan, wait, parang even if ayaw mo kay Putin, parang ay- mas ayaw mo pa na yung isang rebelde ng ganyan na mag-take charge ng Russia. Especially itong tao, mukhang wala siyang political vision. Kaya nga, walang nag-defect sa kanya eh. Walang nag-defend, walang nag-resist, pero wala rin nag-defect. Doon nakita natin na Para to be an effective rebelde, kailangan meron ka political capital and political vision. And that's exactly what was missing here. And that's my understanding of why the coup folded at the 11th hour. Alright? Maraming salamat mga kameta. Thank you very much. Talk to you soon. Have a good weekend. Oh, by the way, kanina lang kausap natin si ano, isang guest natin later on tonight. Please uh, follow us. Si, uh, tapos na ba yung Pride Month ba? Pasensya na, hindi ako nag- uh, yeah, so yung founder ng Lad Lad Party List, uh, isa sa mga LGBTQ activists, kausapin po natin, interview natin siya. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk Danton. So later tonight na yan, mga kamayta, mga podcast. So para naman, medyo ibang tone na tayo kasi over the past 48 hours, medyo intense talaga itong situation na pinapanood natin at follow natin. Alright, on that note, mga, mga kamayta, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I hope you appreciate uh, yung mga ginagawa natin updates dito hindi tayo nag, nagkakalat lang hindi tayo nag, I'm, I'm showing you the different sides different angles I'll post dun sa baba yung mga pwede nyo basahin pwede nyo ma-appreciate dyan pwede nyo makita dyan alright para you can see where is this analysis coming from alright huwag kayong maniwala dun sa mga ano dyan mga operators dyan <laughs> mga twitter spaces my goodness sumala ko dun sa mga ibang twitter so ay purong kalakuan lang mga nandun mga bunch of guys who have no idea about 
military coups, uh, political transitions, history of Russia, forget about it. Forget about, you know, uh, mga feeling expert ni mga yan. Alright? Again, I am doing this not as a Russia expert per se, but as a political scientist. This is what we do. We started coups, we started political transition, we started great powers, and Russia is still one of the great powers, no matter what's happening. Alright? Maram salamat, God bless, and talk to you soon.